But today I thought we could talk a little bit about vlogging because vlogging has been a huge part of YouTube for so long. Like I've been on YouTube since 2006, kind of like the year it started. Um, and there's been di many different types of vlogging over the course of its history um, from like your BF versus GF, which was like a YouTube channel who would sort of do pranks on one another. You had Roman Atwood doing his vlogs, which were huge at the time. You had people like Tabuscus who had like the daily vlog where he would literally just whip out his iPhone and talk to it for five minutes. Do you remember Tabuscus? I used to, I was obsessed with his content. Do you know what? I was like the biggest Tabuscus fan when I was younger. Like he, in my opinion, crushed YouTube. He had like four or five YouTube channels and he'd be uploading all of the time and he'd be doing it to such an insane level. Um, and one of the channels was a vlogging channel and it was, it was, I think he called it the lazy vlog because he would just get his iPhone out, click record and just talk to it um, for a couple of minutes. And then that would be it. I never really used to watch them too much because not, they were literally lazy, like nothing ever happened. Um, and yeah, you just had loads of different people doing vlogs over the years. And then you had Casey who came around 2015, who just absolutely changed the game in terms of vlogging of kind of like bringing this third party perspective where it looked like someone was filming him as he walked down the road. Um, bringing in the music. Like I was obsessed with his vlogs every single day. Um, you've had then sort of Gary V, I think was like quite prevalent in the business area with Daily V, which was more like a business orientated vlog that did really well for growing his brand. Um, and there's probably loads of other people that I'm forgetting. And I would say more recently, we've had people like Eric doing daily vlogging again. Ryan Trahan sort of does a series of vlogs, you know, for a month with his Penny series. And yeah, it's, it's just interesting how it, chops and changes. And, you know, I think for the last few years, we've been in like the Mr. Beastification area as, as people sort of like to call it. Um, and a lot of it's, a lot of the content outside of that has seen why that has worked and thought, okay, it's all about optimizing absolutely everything. And I think in that process, we have lost a little bit of that authenticity and of just like the Tabasco sort of self, just turn on the camera and talking to it. Um, you know, that used to work very well back in the day with like Zoella and Alfie Days and their sort of vlogging. Um, and I just wonder sort of where, where we're going over the next few years and if that's going to come back um, and how that will also impact the more talking head educational type videos that we see out on the platforms. So yeah, very long intro spill, but I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on, on where we are with vlogging. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a difference between creators whose main thing is vlogging. So like Casey obviously put a lot of time and effort into it. But then there's Emma Chamberlain, whose whole thing is just chill, relaxed vlogging, where it's just, just the personality and that's her main thing. But then you get other creators who do um, maybe a certain type of video as their main thing. Maybe they do tech reviews or maybe, um, yeah, something else. And then they have maybe a vlogging channel on the side, like Eric has a fairly new-ish vlogging channel where he's started doing daily vlogs. Um, so I think there are probably, there's a different conversation to be had around, do you want to start a vlog on the side versus do you want to go all in on vlogging? Um, and I think if you want to go all in on vlogging, it's, I mean, it sounds harsh, but it's probably just depends a lot on your personality and what you're doing. Um, so this guy, Sam Sulek has been blowing up pretty recently. I'm sure you've seen that just posting his gym workouts and talking in the car and it's very very minimal low lift uh production quality but it's people just like hearing him talk and hanging out in the gym with him and he's getting like half a million to a million views every single day yeah his channel is just nuts like he just just feel like he's came out of nowhere and as you say it's just these long videos of very minimal editing I think why he is, his videos probably work is people are following along in the gym. Yeah. I think that's why that series is doing quite well. Same. I feel I, I, my, my instinct is that people are not following along in the gym. They're sitting at home and they are living vicariously. <laughs> maybe, him. maybe. Like, yeah, yeah. I guess that's kind of worse though, gym, right? That's yeah, because, but they're not getting the gains. He, he is. He's just kind of, you just sat there on the sofa with a bag of chips watching uh, someone work out. I mean, I guess it's you like could do that in the downtime, right? maybe. Yeah, yeah it is. It's like watching a streamer play, play games. games. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Mm. Well, then, do you think um, there's kind of, uh, based on the examples that we've just talked about there, if we're talking about pure vlogging and like whether it's something that you want to do, it seems like you've either got to be 
fairly well established anyway, or be doing something that's so kind of bizarre, uh, extreme, um, like that, that if you're just a, a nobody quotes and you just want to talk about your life, then maybe that wouldn't work out so well. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts on this because I think if you want to start ju- just the channel around vlogging and you're not doing anything spectacular in there, you need to have a very interesting personality. I think that's why someone like Emma Chamberlain did so well and she is basically just a vlogger is because she's quite funny, she's interesting, she does these quirky things and people like to watch that. Whereas if it's just an average person who's doing it and they're not really doing anything within their vlogs, they don't have any unique insights into the world, they're not funny, you're not going to get any traction. Whereas if you are more known for something else and then you start vlogging, it can actually show that different side to you. Because I think a lot of people, like if we take MKBHD, for example, he's a tech channel, all he's doing in his videos is talking about tech, but then he can have a second YouTube channel where it's him and his team being more relaxed and you actually get to see their personality a little bit more. That is good for building that relationship with the audience and it still benefits the tech channel, even though on the tech channel, you don't get to see that personality as much as a vlogging channel. Um, I think like that's more what's going to happen because you know, if you look at Alex and Leila Hormozzi, um, they do the talking head style, giving a lot of advice, business advice in their videos. But now they have a series called The Whole Moses, which in my opinion is just like the Kardashians because it's shot very similar of like having these interview segments where they're just talking to the camera with this backdrop, kind of like the Kardashians do. And then it intersplices the real life footage of them being captured walking around, similar to how it was with Daily V, with with Gary Vaynerchuk. So it's, it's interesting how, you know, the the new media is sort of looking at the old media in a way and sort of bringing that through. And their content strategy is to have those vlogs to give the other side of the coin. Because I think you can be someone who gives the advice all of the time. But a lot of the time it's like, we actually want to see you do the thing that you're, you say you do. And I think that's Alex and Leila Hormozzi's sort of approach. Um, and, you know, you wouldn't necessarily get that with someone like MKBHD. That style of vlog wouldn't suit him. But having someone roaming around the office, bringing others into the fold with his team, similar to uh, Linus Tech Tips, who's also done it. I feel like you kind of you have to look at how you want to approach vlogging, you know, um, and, and if you have an established audience or not. I think one really nice thing about vlogging, if you're an established creator, is that um, it. <laughs> It's easy to get tunnel vision on what you're going to make your main videos about. I'm going to make it about the new MacBook Air or blah, blah, blah. Um, when, in fact, a lot of your audience are interested in the weird little things that are maybe not worth making a whole video on. But if you stack them all up together, like what kind of mouse does MKBHD like? How does he have his studio laid out? Who? How does he talk to his animator? Um like what does it what what does his kind of what does it actually look like when he's using his studio on a normal day as opposed to giving a studio tour um when you stack all these things together and you see them as just like little segments of one whole vlog you can see why a vlog can be really compelling especially to someone who's watched a lot of your content it's more uh all these little tangible interesting little bits could i ask you guys do you have anything on on that george yeah oh yeah so I, I'm interested in what you guys think because I not uh, I not I'm not someone who watched a great deal of <laughs> vlogs um, in my past. Uh, I'm so not super familiar. I didn't kind of come up with Casey Neistat when he was first blowing up. Um, yeah, like it's not really been. A oh my god, George! Consumed. That's that's like missing. I don't even know what. It's, it's just like such a huge thing. To have missed. Mm, have you gone back and watched the vlogs at least? I, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've watched loads of his stuff now. And, okay. like, we we okay, had good. to like, study it for like one of the channels that we were briefly working on when we worked with Ali. And like now, yes, I've kind of I've seen it. But I think for me, I I basically stopped doing YouTube just in like 2013, 2014, because all my exams went like not as well as they should have done. Uh, and then I kind of like quit my YouTube channel, quit. I just focused basically to get into a good university. Um, but so, yeah, I missed all of that. And so I'm, I'm interested in like what, why is this just like the classic thing, like how fashion kind of revolves and uh, each new era is like a kind of rejection of the last or, or what is it you, why is it now you think that this kind of thing is is coming back into what people enjoy watching? I think some people are just a bit tired of the whole 
<clears throat> I think it's two things. I think the audience to a degree are a little bit bored with the optimization of everything of showing no personality um, because you've got to have hit these exact points to, to, to work with your attention, which I see so many people doing. Um, you have a lot of creators in the entertainment sort of side of things who are now just doing more of like the Mr. Beast sort of format. I think audiences are just kind of like a bit dumb with that to a degree now. And I think from a creator's perspective, from the many creators that I speak to, none of them either don't want to do that or it just doesn't seem like fun. You know, it just seems like a headache to kind of like do that sort of thing. And in previous episodes of, of this podcast, we've spoken about, you know, the use of a teleprompter. And I've worked with different creators now. And whenever we've used a teleprompter, where it's heavily scripted to nail every single point and to keep them very much on the rail so they don't riff and go off on tangents, their AVD, which is the average view duration, is much higher. And we find that we're giving more value to that viewer in a shorter duration because we're not allowing that creator to go and riff. But from my creator's perspective, they don't enjoy that because it's like, I just feel like I'm reading from a teleprompter because they are, right? They're not, they're not actually being able to show their personality to, to live in that moment. And it is almost like you're a TV host, right? Whereas YouTube, it, YouTube's original slogan back in the day was called broadcast yourself because that's what it was. It was about showing who you are and just being very natural. And I feel like now we've sort of morphed over into more like a television presenter sort of star where you're reading from a teleprompter and it's just not the same. And I think because the audience and the creator both aren't enjoying it too much, it's, it's just resulting in this world where we're now going into the opposite. So for an example, I, I'm the channel manager for Davey Fogarty's YouTube channel. And if you don't know who Davey is, he's on Shark Tank as one of the investors in Australia. And he's also uh, the founder of the UDI, which is one of those big blanket things that you can wear. Um, scaled that business to 500 million in just, I think like five years. So like really good growth. Very, very good entrepreneur. Knows a lot about e-commerce. Started working with him. We were coming up with these ideas, looking at what was happening on YouTube and other niches. Kind of looked at sort of the, the, the videos that had done well. And we created our own version of that. And they did perform well. But it just didn't feel authentic for me or for him. Like we just felt like this was in the right direction because we're using a teleprompter and the ideas didn't feel like they fit him. And now we've started to do daily vlogs where we're getting a look at who Davey is as a person and getting those key insights into how he runs his business. And it's just so much better than him to do it with a talking head style, sat down talking, reading off a teleprompter. It's just night and day difference. And as a result, the AVD is higher than it's ever been. We've got more views than it's ever been. The click through rate is going crazy because people want to see the genuine uh, Davey. And I think that, that 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 again is just like another confirmation for me that that is what the audience wants because if they didn't, they wouldn't be coming back every single day. And that's also why we made it daily was because we wanted to take, um, you know, a hold of this trend at the moment with Sam, who's doing it. We've seen that with Ryan Trahan doing daily vlogs. We've seen it with Eric. And now we've done this in the business area where there is no one doing business daily vlogs, how Davey's doing them at the moment. Um, and so we're trying to really like establish him as, as that's, that's what you're going to get when you come to this YouTube channel. I think there are a few different categories that you can put vlogging into. So one is the creator who is really well versed in how YouTube works, has probably done lots of scripts before, or has just done a load of vlogs and knows which beats to hit and when to stop talking and when to start talking. Casey Neistat, case in point. Then you have people whose content is mainly about just delivering information to the viewer. Um, and as you say, Jamie, I think scripting probably on the whole is better. While you can still have other videos to have an outlet for your personality, probably scripting is better. Um, and then you have people whose content could work unscripted or scripted. And I think maybe in the short term for that person, scripting could be better. But in the long term, maybe there are kind of hidden benefits to doing a more relaxed, non-scripted approach in that you get better and better at that kind of video. I know, George, you probably have a lot of opinions on this scripted versus unscripted thing, because I know you did a whole debate with Justin Moore, right? Yes. Yeah, I was on, on his podcast, uh, de uh, debated a guy called Milo, who runs a channel called Mr. Ruffle Waffles, Mr. Ruffle Waffles. Um, and 
yeah he he's been doing uh yeah like unscripted uh off the cuff stuff for ages like he's been on youtube for for years and years and years and so uh, you know these debates like the, this particular one as they all are they're deliberately set as like a polarized thing but as i think we've probably discussed in other episodes like i i think an issue that that people maybe have is taking any piece of advice about youtube to its extreme um and so i i don't sit fully in the camp of like everything should be scripted and i like uh, you know, for example, so working with uh, Mike Shake, it's like he does his thing on camera and then we build the kind of story. I mean, the story is already there, but it's like we build the voiceovers around it. We can decide based on like what he's said at the time, like, oh, we could summarize these like four uh, bits of footage with one piece of voiceover and some B-roll. And so it's like you then get a bit of the, be the best of both worlds where you've got the kind of naturalistic stuff that's happening. But there's then like scripting that almost happens after the filming. Uh, which again isn't totally possible with uh, with more educational stuff, but even like you know other clients that I've worked with have had this kind of revelation recently where it's like they're they're trying so hard to stick to uh, like uh, an approach a, a super a heavily structured approach to how they should film things in the moment uh, for the sake of optimization that it feels. Uh, like a cage and uh, you know one client in particular has like come to me and has said like I'm just I'm not feeling like I'm enjoying it as much because I don't feel like I can be as free in front of the camera I feel like I'm constantly thinking like how does what I'm saying now fit into like this this like uh, retention optimized structure that I'm trying to stick to and that obviously impedes enjoyment which is yeah not not a good thing either so it's always nuanced a, a problem I've I've noticed with uh, that can pop up when you're editing someone who's speaking off the cuff is that they feel that they, especially if they're less experienced with YouTube, is that they can feel that they have said the thing that needed to be said, but they didn't say it in a way that is coherent or is or is um, short enough. And that bit gets is not usable in the edit. But the person thinks that they did say that chronologically and that the viewer has heard that. Um, and so that can lead to kind of disconnected... Um, uh, rambling so yeah i think um i think if you are vlogging it's it, it takes more practice to get right but um yeah i think there's like a, a slight difference here between vlogging content and non-vlogging content but also with the non-vlogging content being able to use a teleprompter or not within how natural you feel because you can have talking head content that's educational that's not a vlog that's not teleprompted and that I think is like another part to this conversation. Um, you know, I, I feel like vlogs are always just authentic and off the cuff. I don't think you can have a teleprompted vlog, right? Um, but you can have that when it comes to the, the talking head stuff. And, you know, I, I can speak about this from personal experience. You know, when I was younger, I had a gaming YouTube channel and making YouTube videos was th the best thing in the world. And I grew that channel very well um, because I would just, come home from school, I'd make a turn, you know, turn on Minecraft or whatever game I was playing, Gmod, and I would just click record. And my personality was what drove the content. And I would just have fun playing, you know, with friends or, or, or with myself on Minecraft. And that grew the channel. That was enough. Whereas now, you know, I'm in this position where I want to make YouTube videos, you know, with the very limited time that I have. But as a result, I'm like, I need to make sure that this is to a high quality because I need to show that I can practice what I preach. And so I want to take a more um, structured approach to this with a teleprompter and scripting my content. But as a result, it that you know, creating that content takes double the amount of time because I have to really think how I'm going to write this as opposed to just talking which is what i would love to do i'd love to be able to just sit in front of a camera and talk like this about one particular topic but to your point willem it's like am i going to be coherent enough am i going to make that point you know good enough is my content going to be to the point where people want to watch that over someone else who's potentially made uh, the same topic those are like the questions that then cause this sort of clash i think in a lot of creators heads and i think at the end of the day whoever can have a teleprompted script that feels like it's not a teleprompter script and it's very natural will win because they get the benefits of optimizing everything and making sure that the, vi the video is very structured and great. But from an audience perspective, they can't tell. They just think that this is a great script. Um, sorry, a great video where it's just a creator talking to the camera. 
Um, and I think those YouTubers who can do that, who can with a script, work with a script writer and get it to a good point like that, will always be able to beat the person who is probably just talking to the camera off the cuff because they probably aren't going to hit every single point and as be um, as clear and coherent as you'd want them to be. I think it's, uh, there's like, I, I remember seeing one uh, creator booth video. So Ed from Film Booth has his other channel, Creator Booth. And uh, I, I, he, he's got, I think, a bit of the best of both because he's so comfortable and experienced on camera that when something goes a little bit wrong, he can just kind of run with it and make it into a personality thing so like he he the creator booth stuff that we worked on i did a few videos on that channel with him um and it was like it was word for word and he would stick to it as word for word as as possible but there's one bit where he realizes he's like left a cup in shot for the entire thing and he just like he's like mid-sentence and then you see his eyes drift and he's like oh no i've left a cup in shot and and then he like makes it into this little thing where he's like look i have to i'm a human being okay and then it cuts and we then get on with the rest of the video and it just it just makes him it makes what's come before seem off the cuff because it's like he just flows naturally from teleprompter to not and that probably just comes from experience but it yeah like you say best of both worlds can can be achieved by some people it's interesting there's a, so there's a creator i've worked with a few times uh called olia so i've done scripting and video ideas for him and he has this style where he will so he talks about um, I suppose like design, tech, tech reviews, making money online. Um, uh, and his thing is just very polished aesthetic, like desk setups, um, lovely lighting, etc. And his, his second channel is more relaxed. The thumbnails are all just him at the desk with some text on, on the screen. Um, and his style for that is sat at the desk, laptop is on the side, and he will talk and then he'll like refer to the laptop for the next point and then he'll like talk again i don't know if it's the most effective thing for retention but it feels like uh it feels very intimate and like you're talking you're listening to someone who doesn't care that you know that they've prepared beforehand in fact it gives you a little bit of uh feeling like that there is structure he's got his notes he cares about what he's saying but he's also speaking off the cuff like a normal human being um and i quite i quite like that approach i haven't seen that many people doing it um i think, I think it's because it's Oli has been around for so long like he knows his tone of voice he was he's been making videos i got i don't even know when he started but i've been watching him from at least 2016 i would say um and he, he's always sort of been the same. He hasn't changed his personality or how he talks to the camera. He's been himself. And I think that very much comes when you've been around before everyone started to talk about optimization and strategy and how you approach content. Um, and I think because he also sees that as a second YouTube channel, he feels he can be more relaxed. And like you say, it's probably, the, you know, the types of thumbnails and the titles and how he speaks to the camera is probably not the best if you wanted to get the, the most amount of eyeballs on this particular content. Um, but it works for his audience, for the people who do value what he has to say. And if you do that over a long enough period, you will get new viewers, right? The channel growth, you're, you're sort of sacrificing channel growth in a way, but in the long term, it doesn't matter because enough people you will retain and keep. So if you look at someone like Hamza, for example, um, he has many different YouTube channels, but most of them he'll sit down and just talk to the camera for like two hours straight, like no editing, no fancy anything, no music. He just sits there and talks and you can tell it's all off the top of his head. And he just talks about stories from his life, advice that he would give, things that he's read from books. And again, there is no teleprompter there. Or at least like, I don't think there is. I mean, I don't think, you know, a teleprompter can handle two and a half hours of, of constant talking, but he just sits there and talks and he's... His subscribers love it. And he gets millions of views every single video um, because he's had that same approach to Oliov. Like, let me just sit down, talk to the camera, be authentic, show my true self, be vulnerable. People will value that and they'll stick around. And because he's done it for so long with so many different videos now, he has a very loyal following of um, young men who want to listen to him. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like that's that's what's happened with Olia to an extent. Um, I, again, I, I just feel like more people will sort of go that way of having like a second channel where they can just sit down and talk off the cuff without the fear of this messing up, you know, my main channel or something like that. Yeah, I think the experience is really, uh, 
uh, important element. Uh, I, I remember seeing, I might have mentioned this before on the podcast, but I remember seeing this um, uh, video. It, it, the thumbnail is an, is like an oldish man in his 60s with a big gray beard. Oh, the cowboy hiking. guy. No, I don't think he's the cowboy guy. Oh, there's a guy no, who's no, like a cowboy. Not, not and the he's guy just... who sits on his ranch. Not the oh, guy. right him. That's what I thought. This is another there. older American man who's just hiking, and he's just talking about. Uh, I think he's advice for older hikers. I think it was. So I don't know why I clicked. And on you this, clicked on it. <laughs> I did. I don't know what this says about me, but yeah, I clicked on it. Uh, it had like several hundred thousand views, um, and uh, this guy was just talking to camera as he was walking along and he really he didn't seem like digital native at all but he was so relaxed on camera he hadn't posted that many videos either that i remember so i was like what's going on here he's really really good on camera he's just talking really smoothly and then at the end he was like and when i get back home um i'll probably start doing some preaching again i was like that's it like he's been speaking to congregations as a preacher for like 40 years he knows his stuff and uh, i think that's that goes back to that earlier point of that if you are someone who has something interesting about yourself you probably can start a channel from zero you know if you can speak very well on camera like that and you do have interesting things to say you will get the views but if you don't if you can't speak on camera then you know you've you've made it much more difficult for yourself um so question for the uh floor what is what makes if someone wants to start a vlog what uh let's say they've uh already got let's say they've already got a youtube channel that they do things they they they, they cover some other topic and they say maybe i should start doing some daily vlogging or occasional vlogging maybe once a week what advice <coughs> would you give them uh I think it depends if you want to do daily vlogging or daily videos, because you can do a daily video where it's not vlogging. And I feel like if you're brand new to YouTube, you know, let's say you're a 17 year old, who wants to get into YouTube. You don't know what to make videos about. Then I think, sure, go ahead and do daily vlogging or da- daily videos for a month and just make videos on everything that you find interesting because you'll, you will just shorten that feedback loop of learning what your audience likes, what you like to make, um, how to make titles, thumbnails, how to speak to the camera, how to video edit, you know, just see it as a project for an entire month where you're just getting your feet wet. You know, you're just jumping into the YouTube world and experimenting and seeing if this is actually something that you want to do and where you might want to take it. And over that course of that month, you will learn so much. At that point, you can then start to be a little bit more strategic around the direction that you want to make. And You know, it might be that you want to be a vlogger. It might be that you say vlogging isn't for me. I don't like this. I actually prefer to sit down and talk about the notes I've taken from my favorite books or I want to make a cooking channel, like whatever it may be. Um, Just just discovering what you have um, within you, I think, is the best thing for someone who wants to get started on YouTube but doesn't know what they want to do. Um, You know, if, if, for example, you are uh, an individual who's, who has their own business and you want to generate leads to, to to get people into your business, then obviously you're going to take a more engineered approach there of saying, well, I'm only going to take business content, right? It wouldn't make sense for you to do daily videos where you end up making tons of random videos. Um, so if, if you don't know what you want to do, just go crazy. You know, that's what I did for, for the longest time. I did that for many years until I discovered gaming was something I inter- was interested in and a lot of other people were. And I started to get millions of views on my videos. And that's why I, I niched down into that when before I covered so many different things. Um, you know, the audience will really direct you in, in sort of the direction that you might want to go into. The only thing I would add, George? I suppose, after you found that direction, uh, but just specifically with vlogging, is just having the self-awareness to think what part of this footage is interesting just to me and what maybe carries a kind of broader appeal, a broader message what's more likely to evoke an emotion, a curiosity or, or something. Because uh, if you're filming everything, you think I, you just need to be comfortable cutting 90, 95% of it. Um, but again, that will probably come more when you start to care about uh, optimizing it, if we want to use that phrase. But yeah, I, it will get nowhere if it is just stream of consciousness, you doing, you know, showing everything you do in a day. So just having a bit of self-awareness would probably probably help as well. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to have hmm. some value in, in your vlogging. You know, it was like, mm. 
is it entertainment or is it education and and how do you want to approach that i think it's probably easier to be an education vlogger than it is to be an entertainment um because entertainment you you're competing with the big boys right you've got people like airac who are doing daily vlogs and they're doing it much better um than than a new youtuber would but if you're doing education like i said you might have some specific expertise that allows you to create unique videos where you give valuable advice and People want to watch that. And that's why you can then do a 31 days of advice, you know, in the kitchen, for, let's say. And over those 30 days, you you cook 31 different meals and you show us how to do it. Like, that's an interesting channel right there. And if you did that well enough, you, you could do that for, for, you know, years. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not an expert in starting up vlogging from, from scratch. But I think one massive advantage you've got is that there is no real pressure or risk. You can just experiment and that in a sense is an advantage that you have over someone like Eric who probably has a lot more pressure going on with the quality of the videos and if people click and they're disappointed they're like oh Eric has fallen off blah 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 you can just go wild um one thing to bear in mind obviously is if you are vlogging your whole life like be somewhat careful with what you put out um because it can stay on the internet forever etc Okay, I'm finished sounding like everyone's dad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's it for vlogging. Um, thanks for watching. If you've got any comments, leave them below on YouTube. Or if you're listening on audio, please rate the podcast. That'd be a big help for us. And um, yeah, see you next time.